Um, let me start the meeting by introducing myself. I'm Steve Waddell. I'm active in the lead staff role as of the SDG Transformations Forum. Uh, so my head's been very full of uh, preparing a major proposal that we have underway uh, for in response to a request for a 15 million euro um, proposal that includes would include the work of this group um, as a possible um, com as a component of it. Um, so uh, I'm trying to uh, manage a lot of different people's expectations and desires out of this, and also uh, trying to keep the picture on the whole. So it's a very invigorating process, but it uh, certainly filled my head. <laughs> and I guess the other thing that filled my head was that yesterday I was making some presentation at the Academy of Management on a panel, and uh, it was very depressing in one way because they're just nowhere um, really. They talked about how uh, one of the great improvements they made was that a tenured faculty member was now going to be evaluated on their impact. And that was a major achievement. And I just thought, oh my God, here the, we've got these skill issues. And that's what they're talking about. It's what they can accomplish. But um, thank you. Um, so let's move on to uh, John as my co conspirator, co leader here. Thanks. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, and um, I don't know whether um, anyone can see my screen, but just to, as we kick off this round of, uh, of, of connecting everyone. Um, we thought we might um, ask you just to say who you are, who you link to, how you're starting the call and, and how you're hoping to end the call, um, just so we could get, get a better sense of, of, um, of what people are thinking, feeling uh, or, or acting on. Um, so uh, it's John North, um, I'm here in South Africa, linked to the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative. Um, I'm, I'm starting the call today with um, a, a stark reminder um, about how um, people are feeling, uh, the, the, in particular, the climate emergency um, firsthand, having just seen an article about a, a study done in Iceland. Um, and um, I guess the, the, you know, my hope thing is that, is that as I end this call, that the, the idea of uh, connecting um, at a more personal individual level as well with various actors around the globe um, uh, uh, pr helps uh, pr provide some encouragement to, to other people as well, especially since we'll be sharing some of the, some of the learning that this collective is, uh, is, is embarking on. So yeah, I guess I'm, 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 I'm stepping into this call with, uh, with a real sense of almost despair uh, about what's going on around us. Um, but with this glimmer of hope that through relational innovation, we can capitalize globally responsible uh, leadership and practice. So uh, that's how I'm starting the, the call today. Um, and I'll take this, this, the screen off now um, because you've seen the, the, the outline. Thanks so much, John. Edward. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending where you are. Um, I'm Edward Miller. I'm based in Costa Rica at the University for International Cooperation. Um, well, how can you feel on a Monday morning? <laughs> um, but I'm positive. I think um, I think we have to really push things to action. Um, I'm kind of getting desperate. I'm in many groups, and um, there's a lot of discussion on how and very little on, on actually getting things done. And I know there are phases, there, there's times, that things don't move as fast, but every time I look at uh, Twitter or any of the latest news, it just scares the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's on, on record. You can, you can keep it on record. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a, a seven-year-old son and it's just getting me really nervous uh, that I don't see any future for him. And the speed that we need to do the transformation is, is very, very rapid. And I don't see things moving. Um, you mentioned uh, 
these people in, in management, uh, when I look at governments, when I look at the current situation in Latin America and around the world, actually, and how democracy is falling apart, being manipulated with big data and stuff like that. And it, it's, it's a mess. And, and uh, the situation in Costa Rica, which is, uh, I think, a privileged country in many ways, is uh, not very much different right now. Um, but then on the positive thing, I think if we get our act together and move quickly and, and not just keep on discussing about <laughs> the theoretical backgrounds and, and theoretical solutions and actually be able to uh, land these with a very deep root into action, mm -hmm. I'd be happy. Thanks so much, Edward. Uh, Cheryl, how are you doing today? Thank you. Um, first, again, uh, um, I'm new to the group. <clears throat> I'm Cheryl Charles. I actually live in southern Vermont, uh, although I moved here only five years ago from Santa Fe, New Mexico. So I am in the United States. And my link, to use John's word, is probably twofold. Uh, I'm the founding CEO of a nonprofit called the Children and Nature Network. So I bring uh, a commitment to connecting people of all ages with the natural world in there everyday lives. And I serve on the steering committee for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Commission on Education and Communication. So I think those two links are among those that are probably the most relevant to this to this group. How am I feeling today? I just um, watched the your previous, your most previous call. And I'm I'm filled with the I, I think one of the one of the phrases used was the continuum. Um, between extinction and hope. <laughs> so I'm internalizing many of the concepts, the themes that you all talked about. Place-based is one that I resonate with uh, very much. Uh, and I'll, I'll say more about that. My, um, you know, I, I, I work to try to make a positive difference uh, every day to the extent that I can, starting with where I live. My little grandchildren are just down the hill from me, and they are three and six uh, years old. So starting with them, starting with where I live, starting with the habitat that is here, that we feel a family responsibility, that care for uh, over time, all of those things affect my mood every day. And, and what would you aspire for this meeting today? Um, Thank you. Um, it, it, because I am so new to this, I will be listening to see to what extent well, first of all, I'm a committed learner, so I share that with all of you, um, always trying to figure out, um, again, ways to make a positive difference. Uh, and I'll, we'll just see, by the end of the call, if it feels like I can make any kind of contribution, I'll be happy to Okay, some clarity. Thank you. Um, Alain, welcome. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Alain Gauthier. I am based in Portland, Oregon. I am affiliated, I'm a senior fellow at the Portland State University. I'm also on the board of uh, Action Research Plus Transformation. <laughs> and um, I am a very much, I took advantage of these weeks of relatively less activity. I'm under the influence of two books. One is uh, Climate, a New Story by Charles Eisenstein. And the other one is Wide Fragility by Robin uh, D'Angelo. And I think both of them are very perplexing, very, uh, very, very stimulating. And uh, I, I too uh, go back and forth between hope. In fact, I'm going to be part of a workshop in uh, near Vancouver, British Columbia on climate hope at the end of the, at the, end of the month. Uh, so what is there in, to hope for? Uh, knowing that hope is not about expecting something precise, but it's a really attitude toward the, the uh, world. <laughs> uh, and what I hope to get is a better, a clear idea as to what indeed uh, can be done in a collective like this. Uh, I'm also very action-oriented now after spending a lot of time thinking through things. So um, I'm just expectant. Uh, that would be the word that uh, uh, qualifies me most. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alain. 
Claudia, a West Coast partner for you? <laughs> yes, and uh, I'm calling in today from Iceland. Oh. And uh, so I'm connected uh, to this group uh, through Meta Integral. So my partner, Sean Espin Hagens, is, is also on the call. And um, so how do I start the call today? Well, um, I usually live in California and I lived in Iceland for over eight years. Um, and yet the summer just came to an end here abruptly <laughs> by my arrival. So it's only... Um, uh, not even 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 8 degrees Celsius. So that's pretty cold. So I'm kind of a little bit like this, but um, I'm very happy to be on the call. Um, and uh, I'm also bringing to this call today, I've just been working, um, preparing for a conference participation here in Iceland, uh, part of the Wellbeing Alliance. And it's a new uh, economy conference uh, that launches next week. And I'm preparing for a TEDx talk on measuring what matters. So that's very much into where I am right now. And what I'm expecting and what I'm hoping from this call is a kind of more collaborative sense and feeling how we can really tackle all these big problems and the complexity that we are all part of. So that's me. Thanks so Thank much, you. Claudia. Mm -hmm. and, and Johan, our intrepid uh, voyager. Hi, Steve. Yes, I'm in currently in York in the UK. I'm walking home, so it's nice and sunny, so I'm feeling really happy. Um, it's also towards the end of the day, which is even better. Um, so, um, yeah, nice to meet you all. Um, I guess um, I, I'm here because I'm helping Steve with pulling this uh, big proposal together that we, we've got going. Um, and my role I see in this is to help support Steve, but also I'm, I'm listening to what's going on so I can help him with that later on. Um, but I guess where I've seen some, I have some hope is in the work that we're doing at the moment. Um, and it's taken me a while for this to settle in, but um, I, I'm really excited about the vision that Steve's brought, which is um, about how do we actually build the systems to support the stuff that we think is important. And so the value of that is, is, is the, the building of systems to enable others to create value and bring their own value to the world. And uh, I think that's really key. Uh, and to me, that feels big. It feels ambitious. It will be difficult. Um, but it's absolutely critical. So um, I'm trying to step back from my uh, immediate tendency to want to do lots of stuff to being starting to step back and think strategically about how we enhance those collaborations to enable lots of people to do things and more of that and to do that really critical work on the ground that is, is urgently needed. Thank you, Steve. Mm. Thanks, Ewan. Uh, Tony. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, likewise, I, I echo the, um, the comments of others in terms of very, very glad to be on this call and to meet some new faces as well as some familiar ones. Uh, my name is Tony Cook. Uh, like Yoan, I'm also in the UK. Uh, so the rest of you, at least you haven't got Brexit to contend with, um, which is uh, we're all just fed up of, to be quite honest with you. Um, my day job, I'm CEO of something called One Planet Education Networks, which I founded with uh, WWF a couple of years ago, trying to accelerate uh, change agents for the mobilizing of change agents for sustainability. Uh, we've set ourselves a target of a million change agents by 2030. We'll need a lot of help to do that. Um, and in my spare time, I'm a TEDx organizer. So I'm going to be presenting a, a short case on that in my hometown uh, shortly. Um, in terms of how I start the day, I'm actually right in the middle of a an organizational transformation um, right here, right today, um, right in the thick of it. Um, uh, so it's very front of mind for me. Um, uh, and uh, my daily the mood swings uh, from hope to despair, uh, generally, in terms of at a more systems level. Uh, and as a father of three myself, I, I worry about the future facing my own kids. who are now just leaving school, entering uh, the adulthood. Um, and trying to make their way in the world. Um, my own coping strategy, to be honest with you, is a pragmatist, is, is to just do stuff. Um, I love the thinking. Um, I love the intellectual um, stimulation of um, trying to venture into the unknown with some remarkable characters like we meet on the forum. Um, but ultimately, if it doesn't result in some action, um, my patience soon lies thin. 
um, I, I, I need to be doing stuff. It's my only way of, of coping, really. Um, in terms of how I want to end the call, um, well, I'm just hoping for some kindred spirits, some, some alignment in terms of thinking and maybe some, some new ideas that others uh, can suggest uh, in terms of uh, that I can apply in my own daily life. Uh, as well as um, can build towards uh, um, some some of the parts of effect um, out of this uh, emerging collaboration uh, between you all. And so I'm, I'm excited for what's, what might come in the call. Thanks so much, Tony. Uh, Luis. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Camargo. I'm in, in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, I am the founder and director of a nonprofit called DOPEPA, which is Organization for Environmental Education and Protection. I'm also an Ashoka Fellow and a Young Global Leader uh, community member with the World Economic Forum. Um, this morning I woke up surprisingly ready to face whatever comes. So I'm excited for things to come. Um, and I hope at the end of the call I'll, I'll, I'll be a lot more excited because uh, one of my, let's say the two larger projects I'm working with, uh, one is the Weavers Academy uh, with a global cohort of, of educational leaders trying to think how we can uh, focus uh, f uh, to change educational systems for universal well-being. And on the other hand, um, I'm leading the Colombian Regenerative Hub, uh, also with the, uh, the Regenerative Communities Network. And in that, I'm looking into how to embed uh, educational uh, systems and tools for uh, regenerative education in younger kids, uh, in younger ages. So for me, part of my, my big a worry is uh, the fragmentation that we have in all of our systems. Um, and for me, these, these meetings and coming uh, in contact with all of you is just uh, uh, evidence of the defragmentation that's starting to happen and that's essential for the change we need. So I'm really happy to be able to be here and uh, you know put whatever I have to put on the table but also to gather and help keep on connecting all fragmented systems into a, a whole system like we hope uh, we need to change. Thank you. Thank you. The fragment ending, uh, addressing the fragmentation is your end of the meeting uh, goal. So thank you. Um, Alistair. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alastair, Alastair Wiley. I live near St Andrews in Scotland. Uh, so it's late afternoon here. Uh, I'm just realising that um, you are the first people I've spoken to today. I've had a day entirely on my own, um, non-stop reading. But I'm a bit tired. My head is full of all sorts of stuff that I need to sort of leave to one side and forget um, until tomorrow. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm taking this time late summer um, to catch up on, on reading and writing before work starts again. Uh, I work as an independent practitioner, mostly with public sector organisations, um, leadership and organisational development. And my sense that before I get back into that, that a lot of what I do uh, is under the radar it is actually countercultural um, and difficult um, because much of the work that emerges in the room with people in the organizations that I work with is different from the fairly positivist work that is commissioned by the commissioning clients. So I have a sense of two speed organizations, multiple realities uh, in the room, people um, doing the best with what they've got where they currently are. Um, and that's not necessarily where their organization is. And it's not necessarily what I've been hired to do. 
Um, and nevertheless, we are doing radical work in real time. And some of that is difficult because people aren't sure what to do with it. And by the end of this meeting, what would you, where would you like to be? Um, have a, a sense of what's emerging across this fantastic group. Mm -hmm. What might we want to do? Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris. Hi everyone, uh, I'm new to the call too. Uh, so I'm based in the UK. I'm a partner in the GRLI with John uh, and John invited me into the call. So hi from the UK. Um, I spend a lot of my time working with young people as agents of change, um, running programs for their development and resilience. Um, I'm very involved in Extinction Rebellion, which is the social movement uh, around the climate emergency. I'm the coordinator of the visioning group uh, for XR, uh, which is keeping me occupied at the moment. Um, and uh, how I'm feeling, actually, I'm feeling really upbeat today. I live um, on a communal farm, an organic farm, which uh, we run across 20 households. And uh, this weekend we had our potato harvest and it was a bumper harvest. We've had a lot of wet weather and the potatoes love the wet weather. So it was great fun just getting out in the fields and uh, uh, harvesting potatoes. And then this morning I've been pruning pear trees and tending squashes. And so I just feel like I'm living in paradise and loving every minute of it. Um, for the call, um, I have a, a piece of writing that I've been commissioned to undertake uh, around collapse uh, and how organizations might respond to it. And I'd love um, to just explore the possibility of this network having some input into that and maybe different organizations supporting it so we could make it a collaborative effort. Um, and apart from that, I'm just really intrigued uh, about the agenda and uh, about the regenerative uh, communities network which I've kind of been observing from afar as well uh, so just keen to see what's going on thanks so much Chris uh, remind us if we don't come back to it about your request uh, Sean good morning everyone I literally woke up 10 minutes before this call so this feels like the right way to start uh, not only a Monday morning, but a whole week um, connecting with all of you and feeling both the pain and challenge of our moment, but also gathering together to create new possibilities. So it's like if I could start every day and every week um, from this place, that, that would be an improvement. So really wonderful to kick off um, my day with all of you. Um, and I think, you know, this is being echoed by you know, many of you, you know, for me, I actually, I realized as people were kind of introducing, I had this dream um, that I woke up to where I was trying to describe the meta impact framework to someone. And I ended up saying to them that the best way to learn it is just through the application of it. And, and so I think Claudia, you must've been with me because I know that I'm very excited for her and Iceland to be in conversation with all these people there for that event, exploring kind of new economic models. And you know, I think this combination of thinking and doing is really at the heart of what a lot of us feel called to and passionate about and, and recognize the importance of. So for me, what I'm hoping to get out of today is just the inspiration from you know, hearing what all of you are up to. I know we have a few kind of case studies, examples to hear from, including from, from us, um, from Claudia. Um, so I'm excited for just kind of getting into like, okay, what's this look like on the ground um, and how have different people approach this? So for me, I'm passionate about action powered by big picture thinking. Um, so looking forward to finding ways to, to do that together. Thank you so much. Um, Heinz, welcome. Uh, we're just doing a round here, as you can tell, um, how you're entering the meeting and what you hope by the end of the meeting are the core questions. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Heinz Robert. I live in Zurich in Switzerland. Um, I'm just starting to reconnect to different networks. I used to be a bit more connected some years ago and, and uh, was retreating more. I have been to the 
to the um, action research and transformation meeting in Sweden in, in March, where I met also Steve and others. Um, and I was very interested uh, in what's uh, is, uh, emerging here, this uh, networks, uh, networks, and also started to connect some, uh, some people also. Um, my main main interest is uh, in uh, yeah, what I'm doing is, is uh, I'm doing uh, circling, which is a, a relational practice uh, here in Zurich since uh, five years, but also now starting to look out to all of the German speaking uh, Europe, uh, Germany, Austria. Um, and my main interest is uh, in bringing aliveness into organizations. Uh, like I'm also writing a book right now uh, about intimacy and honesty in organizations. Um, and what I want to like at the end of the meeting. Yeah, it's more like. I haven't been at, I think, at the, on the last two calls. So I also interested. Where, where are you with with that? Uh, okay, some clarity about who we are by the end of the meeting. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, John. I'm wondering if you could bring up the slide with the um, questions uh, that are going to follow the cases. So we're going to hear three cases. I'm going to turn it over to John. Um, these are the questions uh, that we would hope to come out of the uh, cases for discussion. Um, just a minute. If uh, I'm just going to mute somebody. Okay, thank you. Um, if we can uh, uh, come out of the cases thinking about these questions. So it's not really questions specifically about the cases. We could have some light discussion about that. But it's really questions about what do these cases uh, bring up for you that we are sharing um, around these questions. So what I would suggest is that we take uh, two minutes of silence and just reflect on these questions um, for ourselves to try to bring us into this uh, collective uh, focus of inquiry. So I'll start the time now. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we have a good idea of who, who all is on the call, what, how we're entering the discussion today, um, how we, what we hope to gain from, from participation here. Um, and as you probably all know, we've, we, we have three volunteers um, from, from a previous call who are, we've all prepared a, a few words, a few remarks um, around specific place-based transformation initiatives. Um, and I'm not gonna say much about those. Um, I'm assuming that they will all be able to share their own screen. Um, um, you've, you've seen the, the reflection questions that have been proposed. Um, um, so the way we'd like to, to run the next uh, 30 minutes or so is to allow um, first Tony, uh, then uh, Claudia, and uh, then of course, Edward to, to each share between seven and 10 minutes. What I'll do is after, seven minutes, I'll just give each of you a signal um, to start wrapping up. If you can keep it to seven minutes, then great. Um, before we move from the one speaker to the next, um, we'll allow a, uh, uh, an opportunity just for clarification questions. So in other words, if there's something that you heard during a particular uh, presentation or sharing that you just need to check out because you weren't sure whether you heard it correctly, uh, then you'll have an opportunity to do that, but we're not going to enter into discussion until we've heard from into deeper discussion until we've heard from all all, all three of the uh, of the sharing. And this is just uh, from a logistics perspective as well. Um, so please do note down your your reflections um, uh, and um, around uh, you know of course what you know the implications of of, of your own work, um, what you're sitting with in terms of guiding principles that might be helpful tools. And then, of course, the, the, the potential for collective impact. Uh, yeah, sorry, I uh, just to double check that you can hear us because your um, phone keeps on hitting itself. Are you still there? Oh, grand. Okay. 
So um, without any further ado, I'm going to, to hand over to, um, to Tony. Um, and uh, uh, Tony, your time starts now. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, uh, John. Um, so I was asked to just present a little bit about um, a recent experience uh, we've had in my own home community um, of uh, setting up a TEDx event, um, the format for which I'm presuming most of you will be familiar. Um, but the transformational impact of it, I hadn't expected. Um, so it's front of mind for me as a very practical way of having some kind of transformational impact within your own community. Um, so just a few slides on that. Um, so first of all, just a little bit of uh, where is Sherborne? Um, it's an ancient rural market town in Dorset uh, in England. Um, it's the former capital of the ancient kingdom of Wessex. Um, it's a very beautiful area. Over 70% of the county is designated area of outstanding natural beauty. So it's a, a, a designated protected landscape. Uh, we have a World Heritage Site, um, the Jurassic Coast, just half an hour to the south of us, um, which is where the first ichthyosaur uh, was ever found in terms of dinosaur fossils in the UK. Uh, we're about two hours west of London, and we've got cities nearby such as Exeter, Bristol, Bournemouth, uh, and Southampton, um, most of which I'm sure you will have heard of. Um, zooming a little bit closer in, uh, as you can see, it's in a, a predominantly rural area smattered with uh, small market towns. Um, it's a very unequal community of young and old um, with not a lot in between, um, of haves and have nots too, again, with not a lot in between. A uh, population of about 12,000, um, of whom uh, about a third are of school age. Um, it has a collection of world-class private schools um, within the town, um, more of in a moment. Um, and then there's a, about three and a half thousand people of retirement age, uh, over 65, and less than a thousand millennials. Um, so we've got a real sort of uh, um, uh, egg timer shaped demographic. Um, people leave when they leave school or university because of the lack of economic opportunity for them. Um, and then perhaps come back uh, when their children are old enough to go to school. Um, very split socioeconomically, uh, about 55% ABC1s, 21% DEs, um, and quite a high average property price, with um, almost 45% of the population owning their home outright without any finance, um, and then another 25% um, not being able to buy um, uh, even, or put a deposit on a house, so they rent. Um, uh, as, a, as a town, it's got a really rich history. Uh, it was, um, goes back 1200 plus years, um, has a, an abbey that was built in AD 705. It has a castle that was built in 1594 by Sir Walter Raleigh uh, with the landscape park by Capability Brown. It has Sherborne School, which is an internationally famous school, which was built in 1550 and has alumni such as Alan Turing, the father of computer science. John Le Carre, the novelist, Jeremy Irons, the actor, Hugh Bonville, the actor from Downton Abbey, um, Chris Martin from Coldplay, and many, many others. Um, so it's got a real sense of its kind of international significance for such a small place. Um, so I would summarize all of that really by saying it's, it's superficially prosperous. Um, it's got a really strong sense of identity that's anchored in this 1200 years of heritage and international significance but it really faces an uncertain future it has uh, a local economy that's still rooted in agriculture tourism retail and education but all of those sectors are really struggling to maintain their relevance uh, to the outside world um, just a few photos to sort of illustrate where Sherborne's at currently I and mean, this was a photo created by a, a student in the town um, which superimposes a, a black and white image from 1851 alongside a current day image. And the point really was that nothing's changed. It's just stayed exactly as it, as it was. Um, and yet, just around the corner, you've got pockets of the town looking like this, which is a very familiar site to the young. It's where they go to hang out, socialise, smoke, drink, take drugs or whatever else they do out of sight of adults. Um, but it's a site of the town that 
most of the adult population don't even know exists. Um, there's a huge range of opinion about the place. Um, everything from it's really not for me, uh, it's full of toffs, um, which is English code for uh, posh people, um, uh, through to ambivalence, uh, through to it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, it really became clear to me, um, and largely I have to say out of the, um, the, the work we've been doing through the Transformation Forum, and it's gnawing appetite to do something in my own hometown, um, as well as to sort of counterbalance the, the global stuff, um, that we needed a land, landmark event to try and identify and confront issues holding us back and begin this process of community-based vision towards a more positive shared future. And, and really a chance conversation with the organiser of TEDx Exeter just down the road from us highlighted the transformational effect that it's had on their city in the last eight years. And I just started to wonder, could we benefit from this in the same sort of way? Um, so I went about securing the TEDx licence, recruited stakeholders, got a team of volunteers together, started to raise awareness around town and awareness of TEDx and TED was actually pretty low. Uh, not that many people outside of education had heard about it. Um, and then started building media partnerships and, and in-kind sponsorships. We also conducted a survey across the community to ask, ask what are the top of mind issues that you believe are holding us back at an individual level, at a local level, at a national level, and at an international level. And we had about 600 participants in the um, survey. And these are the kind of issues, the sort of meta issues and then the sub issues connected to those that came out that were top of mind for the community. And then we use that as a framing device for our event uh, to curate speakers who could speak to these different issues. And uh, in terms of raising awareness, presented personally to about 3,000 people. Uh, we launched an open call, um, which we had over 100 speaker applications for, and then selected 13 speakers across a broad range of topics for, you know, link, aligned to that uh, list of issues. Uh, all of them from the local community, ranging from a 14-year-old at school through to a 65-year-old best-selling international author uh, and everything in between. Uh, and then we had dancers, actors, musicians, slam poets, artists, and so on to try and sort of bring the day to life with some cultural uh, elements. Uh, we Three minutes, uh, Tony. Sorry, just to say. Thank you. I'm, I'm getting there. Don't worry. Um, okay. uh, we had a photography exhibition to try and give voice to the youth's sense of place. This is just one example of that. Um, we even had a Hollywood film score composer write th four original pieces of music for us to set the mood for each of the sessions, uh, which worked an absolute treat. Um, we created a visual identity which kind of married the history and the heritage of the past and the architecture with something that looks a bit like a modern day tattoo. Um, just to be a bit playful and irreverent with it, um, which went down very well. Um, we did quite a lot of PR in print, in radio, um, uh, and on podcasts. And the upshot was tickets sold out within a week. Uh, we had 5,000 people watch on the day uh, via YouTube Live, and we've since had 12,000 people watch the talks from around our community and further afield but mostly from our community. So it's a very, very high penetration in terms of the, the, um, the overall size of our population. Um, we don't really have time for this. Um, I don't know if you can hear it, but it's just somewhere that they, um, so I'll, I'll skip all this. If you can hear the music, I don't know if you can. It's from some of the original music we had composed. I'll move on. The upshot, the reaction from the audience was just nothing like I'd expected at all. These are kind of comments that came back. People thought it was a defibrillator shock for the community. Um, someone said it's finally waking up. Um, someone who'd lived there for 10 years said it was the best day of their life since he'd moved there. Um, I had fathers in tears coming to me saying, you've changed my relationship with my daughters. Um, people, uh, retired people in tears, having heard a young person talk about the environment um, and saying that they felt shamed into action. Um, we had a very high net promoter score, which is off the scale if you know anything about NPS. Um, and the impact within just two months of since the event is 
we've already launched a community mental health initiative or well, we've not but the participants in the event have self-organized around this um, there's a conservation project being launched by the ro local rotary club to bring the youth and the elderly together to restore a river corridor um, the chamber of commerce members have launched pop-up youth centers and shops and cafes after hours to try and keep young people off the street and give them something to do um, uh, outside of school hours um, and we've pulled together a community um, of 200 plus change agents who are aligned now and motivated to act and that's probably the thing I'm most excited about what happens next um, uh, in the final 30 seconds I've got the thing that really surprised me most is just how well a TEDx format works when the aim of it is to try and catalyze transformation rather than it just being an end in itself when it's seen as a means to an end it, it really does act like a magnet it brings young and old together and that really really matters M many of the people taking part in our event were school age or early adults um, providing a platform for all the disparate voices all the stakeholder perspectives really really matters using visual and performing arts elevates the event from being a factual um, or intellectual exploration into the issues into touching people's souls and bringing them to tears um, just through taking them on an emotional journey um, and that mattered then in terms of how much free time we gave people in the day to interact because it was all about audience participation and what are they going to do next as a result of it um, and uh, anyway we're going to do it again we didn't think we would um, there was a huge amount of energy went into it thousands and thousands of volunteer hours um, but everyone is up for it again i'm really excited about what next year holds um, in terms of how this can help to accelerate transformation of our little place in the world thank you so much tony um and i'm sure everyone is applauding with me um uh any immediate questions for clarification so this is not to deepen the, the conversation please hold the diff anything that needs to be clarified i'm not seeing anyone put up their hands okay so Thank you, Tony. We'll come back to that. Moving on then, uh, Claudia, um, do you, can you share your screen, please? Mm -hmm. Or would you like? Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. And your time starts. So, thank you. Um, thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, uh, the presentation that I want to give today is about the transformation of a historic Warm Springs community. And uh, so, this was also the project there um, where Sean and I began to work with each other it's about four years ago uh, and it was actually my um, integral MBA master's project so and after um, we uh, worked with them so this became actually one of our key uh, case studies so Alethea uh, means a truth and uh, so it's all about water so I want to give first a little bit of a context um, about uh, the Sonoma Valley of the Moon. Um, Sonoma Valley of the Moon has been traditionally uh, been with many, many different resorts uh, all around water. Um, the earthquake in the 1900s actually changed a lot of the course of the water and the, what historically was a lot of wells through the warm water uh, has actually reduced to uh, one of the last publicly available pools uh, that we see here uh, it's also known as morton's warm springs um, and so it was really a place of history um, from the early days on uh, it's known that uh, uh, natives have been native people that have been gathering there and it, uh, been as a warm springs resort since uh, 1800s and turned in the 50s into really like a traditional space of american barbecue um, so a lot of kind of uh, awareness towards nature faded away and it was acquired by a group of uh, family and friends uh, in 2000, um, uh, five years ago, which may is 2016-ish around this. And so the idea was really to really bring back uh, the awareness of nature and that we really all part of nature and really create a healing space. So 
And why that actually sounds a little bit of a contradiction, because on the one hand, you have this kind of like concrete uh, Americana barbecue piece, really bringing this awareness into the community. Um, the group of original um, uh, three and later up to 10 people, uh, they are really gathered, uh, doing a lot of transpersonal work and really exploring what this really means to restore the land and the community. And uh, so as you can see, lots of volunteer hours went in to clear the space, really make it uh, accessible, open the spaces that were otherwise kind of not really uh, connected to the land and created really systems to really honor the cycles uh, of nature, uh, rhythms of water, land, season and people. And uh, as a governance practice, we really looked at water and the spiral of water and really came up with different rings of engagement to allow a large field of volunteers to really uh, be uh, actively involved uh, depending on their awareness and ability to support the project. And uh, so after the first uh, year where we really were kind of uh, working hard on creating this regenerative vision to moving away from an exploitive system and really creating other forms of wealth building and restoration, as you can see a couple of numbers uh, from the initial years, um, we had uh, uh, many, many, many thousand hours of unpaid volunteer hours. Uh, and on top of this, when we looked into our traditional accounting metrics, um, the actual uh, profit bottom line was kind of really uh, very poor uh, and uh, almost not allowed the project really to sustain. And so this really uh, kind of uh, switched the whole group into kind of a mode of scarcity. And uh, so that led me out to kind of explore what other forms of value accountings are there. And uh, that's how I found actually Sean. And really we began to explore the work uh, with the meta impact framework. And um, so the meta impact framework has been developed uh, by Sean. It's based uh, on his uh, study of uh, many, many different multi-capital systems uh, and resulted in this rather simplistic view of really bringing 10 different capitals or resources or values together, uh, defining, dividing them into four different impacts uh, and creating a technique uh, where you are really allowing to measure both the tangible and the intangible, so the qualitative and the quantitative metrics to really create a system where the group, in this case, Alethea, was able to work with and really move from scarcity into a sense of abundance. And um, so what was our core intent there is really creating a methodology to really make the value that we really found uh, and how, we, how that really is able to translate into another form of uh, wealth building. And uh, one of the important part was really also to summarize all the a time that we spent and really this kind of heartfelt investment. Uh, this really was kind of at the core and I think is at the core at many, many uh, not-for-profit organizations uh, to really find ways how to measure them. Um, and uh, to also really uh, illustrate the different uh, impacts that we really had uh, uh, outside of the tra tra traditional for-profit orientation. Um, and uh, mostly um, uh, or to really summarize also the, the impacts and the challenges. So really looking also at the shad shadows and seeing like where, can, where are we really failing? What are the elements of improvement? And therefore using the framework as a methodology to create a strategy. And uh, so what we uh, started to work with, um, so when we began to work with Sean, uh, which by the way, led me <laughs> into the, um, uh, my role to become a core member of Meta Integral, um, is this very simple asset map. Uh, so the simplified map uh, that usually when you're looking at the traditional uh, P&L and for profit um, um, balance sheet, uh, you would focus on the financial uh, capital or resources, uh, uh, if, the, for, if the term capital may be not appropriate for all um, engagements, uh, and really uh, beginning to really fill out what we really have. And this is kind of a, a very simple way how we um, illustrated the ones that are kind of now uh, darkened a little bit. So health, natural, cultural, social, and psychologicals are really the strengths of this project. Um, so here we really, 
uh, identified that the value is really the highest. Um, and uh, I don't need to go through all the different capitals, but you really see that there is an immediate uh, sense of really going away from scarcity into like, well, we have a place of full abundance. And that little sw switch uh, of awareness actually allowed the team to really come from a different point, to come from a different uh, element if the ask was there to really uh, get more money from donors or other support. Um, so the, um, uh, there's a little chat message coming in, three minutes. Just to say um, three. Yeah, um, oh no, my clicker doesn't work anymore. Um, why is this, okay, like this, okay. So I'm just going now, uh, just very briefly over this, uh, the different um, uh, uh, slates slides here. So the next uh, piece that we really are doing is to looking at the link at different capitals. Uh, why is this important? Because we really want to make visible the different interaction, the different flows between all the different values. Um, and that actually allows to really get a, um, a life sense of the, of the, of the system. And um, so how was this used further? Well, the first uh, end of the year report um, actually uh, was used to really go through all the different um, resources to all the different capitals and defining both the impacts and the challenges. And this extremely comprehensive document served two, two uh, reasons. A, it really was for the core team, the way how to make visible what they actually achieved and allowed the partners and the community members, the investors and the donors to really see clearly where the resources went and how they were spent. And um, so why is that important in terms of transformation? Well, I mean, first of all, um, if you're looking at the different uh, uh, impact areas, so we really uh, showed how we can really change the hearts and minds, the behaviors, the relationship and the systems, and really coming from this from an inner perspective uh, of this core group, but also really changing the hearts and minds, the behavior and the relationship and the systems that the people who came to visit the uh, springs as well were changed. And uh, so, uh, the, uh, we are talking uh, about different impacts. So the deep impact was really to change from the scarcity mindsets into a sense of abundance, of well-being, not only for the group who uh, were managing and stewarding the springs, but also those who come to visit. Then the clear uh, impact uh, was for the team to really understand where the skills and where the behaviors were that were needed for the step forward. As on a result of this, um, uh, the uh, the whole group uh, made a self-assessment of where the different skills, again, based on the, uh, on the four, on the 10 capitals, were important to really uh, uh, create more uh, impact and how they can grow those skills. And the high uh, impact, I think, is one of the most important one really to transform from this vision of just a landowner or businessman to really be a steward of an ecosystem. Uh, and then the white impact uh, really touched on the really changing of the uh, culture from a classical Americana barbecue to culture that honor really the local food and culture diversity. The majority of uh, people coming to the springs uh, are those who are farming the wine country. Uh, so by introducing them uh, to uh, reintroducing them to local and organic food, uh, I think this whole project turned and shifted tremendously. And uh, so here is kind of a little bit of an overview of the different impacts and which, uh, what are they transforming and the way how we really doing this is by changing the stakeholder experience um, in different uh, levels. And um, so this uh, principle of the meta impacts that we've been developing, uh, we are uh, bringing this not only to nonprofit but also to for-profit groups and organizations, to communities, uh, to um, communities uh, and are currently exploring to create a value accounting system uh, app uh, where uh, both uh, individual organization and whole communities can track their transformation based on the different values that they're having. Julia, thank you very much. And uh, okay. I'm sure everyone is very delighted to learn about the wonderful framework. Um, and uh, and your case. Are there any questions, um, Steve? Uh, just one. Uh, who was your sponsoring group? How did they organize? To who was it organized to 
invite you in or? Uh, that was part of my um, master's MBA. So this was my apprentice, my, uh, how do you say this in English? Um, my case study um, that I worked on through my integral MBA at Meridian University. So it was you that organized the community to participate in it? Correct, uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, any other questions for clarification? Brand, I'm sure we'll come back with, with lots of insights and reflections on that, Claudia. Thank you very much. Eduard, last but not least. Yep. Um, okay. Everybody see the screen? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, basically, um, I'll go very quickly through the introduction. I think we're all converted. But what has led us to, as a university, to go into regenerative development instead of sustainable development, and from the reductionist approaches to try to go to holistic integration of all the different areas that we have to cover. And um, I think we all are really aware that we're in a critical moment in the history of the planet. Um, what's happening in many countries in even in Latin America with Bolsonaro, Guatemala is the same thing, Honduras is the same thing. Um, and we're having the same threats of the right, extreme right wing, uh, coupled with religious groups that are taking over. We're also looking at the massive impacts of, of climate change, migration. Central America is um, one of the hotspots for migration. We have these massive caravans moving up north. Um, it's in the news all the time. And basically what we did was based on the planetary boundaries approach, which defined the safe operating space for humanity and looking at the main global changes, uh, we came to realize that a lot of the people, even academics are not aware that biodiversity loss is probably the most critical aspect uh, for humanity at the moment, followed by fertilizers, which don't even show up in the UNFCCC or the CBD negotiations. Both of those are way beyond the zone of uncertainty, um, followed by land use change and climate change is actually in the fourth place. And if we look at the impact of agriculture on global change, not climate change, but global change, it's responsible for 80% of what we're actually looking at. So um, when I see all the, the focus on electric cars and, and, and things like that, Actually, there's, it's all cosmetic. Uh, we really have to get down to, to, to the soil, to the agriculture and change our habits of destroying ecosystems. And it's all mapped out. I mean, um, everything is out there. We know exactly what we have to do. Um, I always say this is the best documented, scientifically documented planetary extinction. We know exactly why we're gonna disappear. And I see all these people still worried on more research, on more in-depth uh, understanding, and uh, I'm just into action, action, action. We have too much data, information, knowledge, but we're missing is transforming this into wisdom. So how do we move forward? And what do we call development? What, what are our models? Uh, and coming from a, a German family, Germany has been unsustainable uh, before I was born. So many of the developed countries, many of which are you're sitting in, actually got to that stage of development by parasiting the rest of the planet and using the resources of the rest of the planet. So if we look at with the donut economy and the Leeds University work on the country's uh, donut, if I look at Germany, yeah, the social threshold is 100%, but at what cost? A huge cost in planetary boundaries and ecological footprint and so on. If we look at uh, Costa Rica and Chile, two Latin American countries, we can see that Costa Rica has a better social threshold. Our inequality is growing, uh, mostly because of the free trade agreements and the open markets. Uh, but Chile's is actually worse, a lot worse. And uh, Chile has a social threshold similar to the one in Costa Rica, but at a huge expense in terms of impacts. So I would actually say Costa Rica is a lot more developed than Germany or Chile in terms of uh, our achievements in social development uh, if we measure it with the impacts that we have caused 
at the planetary boundary level for the country. And if I look at the social progress index, uh, I can see that Costa Rica and Germany in terms of health and wellness are at the same level and Chile is way down. So um, definitely I don't look at Germany as a development model. I think Germany should look at us on how to develop, but we're still not there. Um, and another very important thing is that all our environmental education programs actually made the mistake of telling people that they had to care for nature. If they would have learned that we depend on nature and if nature's not there, we don't exist, it would have been a lot different. People have the idea that go plant a tree and recycle a bottle and they're doing good. Uh, and actually it has to be uh, a responsibility uh, factor that comes in. So basically looking at agriculture, um, we're at the verge of really uh, destroying the, the capacity to produce food. Uh, we have about 8 billion hectares of degraded land. 2 billion of them are severely degraded. So we have to use that. And it isn't until now, this is the last IPCC report that came out a couple of weeks ago, where land is recognized as playing an important role, also plays an important role in the climate system. Um, and if we look at the emissions of CO2 at the global level, CO2 equivalent, and all the international meetings we've organized to reduce that and coming to the Paris meeting, which seemed to be the successful meeting, we see a huge increase after the Paris meeting. And if we look back, the only thing that actually decreased emissions was the financial crisis. So we need a huge financial crisis at the planetary level. We need to get rid of the Wall Street system very quickly. So going back uh, to how we make decisions, I mean, if we were told by our doctor that we had a cancer and we had three to three months to a year to live, would we uh, do the five trips we want to do in the first three months or will we plan them after the three months? And I think that's the, the big decision we have to make. What, what is our time frame? If we look at the scenarios, I'm not saying we're gonna go extinct by 2026, but that is one of the scenarios that's there. And it has all to do with, with uh, the rapid, abrupt climate change factors, um, 3 point some million hectares on fire on July 29th, which was the Earth overshoot day this year. Um, and all the factors that are coming in with, with the methane release. So basically, um, going back to the Earth Charter, we have to make the decision of what we want to do as humans on the planet right now. So that's where we come into the solutions and working on regenerative development. Basically, it's, it's a holistic approach. And looking at, at the basis of, of all development being the ecosystems that function and provide the services. And the metrics we have to change. We need to go to measure equality, transparency, happiness actually, instead of a gross domestic product, which actually only measures the flow of money. So we have to focus on well being, and we're actually part of the Well Being Economy Alliance movement. And even the Pope says it we have a great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge in front of us. So we need a, a long path of renewal. So humans have to change their way of doing things. We need uh, new attitudes and forms of life, and we need to move to global empathy. So using the six pillars, and most of the SDG stuff is done with environmental, social, and economic aspects. The academy works on those. Uh, very few universities are actually working with political structures, mm -hmm. cultural, in the terms of living culture and the spiritual components but we need to integrate those and especially in the dynamic process of change that we're facing right now. So the way of doing this is actually focusing on territories and looking at these layers, uh, not through the disciplines, but actually across the disciplines and um, seeing how we can integrate actions with all the different people working together uh, based on these territories. And the idea basically is uh, on the long term uh, to be able to put Costa Rica back into the correct donut. So these are the large metrics we're gonna be using. We've been working with Kate Rayworth on this, uh, reverse the uh, ecological footprint and actually have higher biocapacity coming back. This is done with a lot of different organizations. Uh, a year ago, 
uh, we established the first hub, it's Regenerative Costa Rica hub. We're working on six territories. It's about 40% of the country's surface. And basically this is linked to a larger effort that we're doing together with Capital Institute on the Regenerative Communities Network. So it's a set of learning sites. What we're doing right now in Costa Rica is identifying the low hanging fruit, all those experiences that are regenerative and that we can bring together to work as a learning platform for the country. So we have farms with permaculture, we have farms with different things that are regenerating the landscape um, and the society, the economy, and transforming those into a, a learning network. So basically, the idea is to have a global uh, network of different sites and together actually look for solutions. So our focus uh, is strongly on the education of, of professionals that we need now. And this means that we have to change the way we learn. We have to change what is important to learn. We have used a lot of the scenarios which are not taken into account in planning and how to work with this in transdisciplinary approaches. We actually are developing uh, or working with future scenarios methodology in cooperation with many different uh, organizations, working at the, at the government level and public policy at the company level and uh, using traditional knowledge. So here on the right, we have Manuel Castellanos, which is a Lacandon Indian. And on the left, um, a work done by Columbia University on regenerating landscape in the Chiapas region. And the one who knows how to bring back ecosystems is Manuel not the high tech science from our Western knowledge system. And there we have uh, very good soil within a few years with these uh, traditional knowledge structures. So basically the territories, uh, what we're trying to do now is um, start training uh, first responder teams for regeneration. So bringing youth to the territories and they start learning how to regenerate when they're already at the degraded lands. Uh, we're starting a pilot project now in September and see how it does. And it's not only about ecosystems, we have to work on the social structures, the economical, regenerative economics, uh, putting companies together, locally sourced foods, uh, together with ecotourism and rural tourism, and especially bring uh, the spiritual component, ethics, values, we're working very closely with the Earth Charter now since basically we started uh, writing the Earth Charter. Uh, so the education model has to transform from uh, what we consider a leader, which leaves everybody else behind, to actually more collaborative type of leadership. So a collective action, going from the clusters to actually co-creating solutions within this network at the national level and at the global level so we can actually start bringing solutions to the ground in large scale. So we're not talking about academics, we're working with farmers, we're working in local communities, we're looking, working with local political leaders and trying to move from um, educating in knowledge to changing behavior and that is competence, passion and the spiritual background that we need to bring in. And instead of diplomas, we're going to be developing through uh, basically blockchain uh, a passport of education so the students can demonstrate what their uh, actions are actually uh, that they have achieved instead of hanging a piece of cardboard on the on the wall so this will of course require new leadership and there we have to go structuring that leadership um, and i think we can see over the last 20 years that there's slowly a movement to this common house and more knowledge. So it's, it's easier to move now than it was five years ago. And I just hope that we are the ones who can actually achieve this change. So basically that's um, my message. Well done, Edward. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, and in particular also for uh, stark reminders at the onset of your presentation about how we are, as someone recently said, rearranging the elephants on the deck of the Titanic. Yeah. The Titanic, yeah. 
So any questions for clarification? Um, and maybe we can uh, just exit the uh, screen. Um, sorry, I think Steve or Edward, one of you needs to. Here we go. Anyone who would like to clarify anything in terms of what Edward has just shared? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> what I'd like to propose then is that we I'm going to put up the, the questions that we shared earlier on, uh, just as a, as a little reminder. Um, and um, we have <clears throat> roughly 15 minutes or so, which is probably not quite enough since there's been so much uh, shared here. Um, but maybe there are some, some burning insights or uh, uh, sharing that uh, people would like to do as a result of having heard from the three presenters uh, that were so generous with, uh, with their, uh, their time and, and energy and, and insights. Well, I would like to suggest that um, Edward, at the uh, at these were marvelous uh, uh, presentations. Thank you so much. I deeply appreciate them. It seems to me that Edward was uh, suggesting an agenda at the end um, that resonated with what I'm uh, interested in advancing. Is there some way that um, we can uh, build what I think or develop or emerge or create coherence among our activities to create this um, system that we need to shift the ability to um, really transform the world, the capacities around us. Um, we've had lots of discussions in organizing this collaborative sites, learning sites for, for the network. And uh, we have way too many um, closed island silos of success stories. Lots of eco-villages, over 10,000 eco-villages, but they're basically from the border of the eco-village to the inside. And the key is how do we move out of these uh, success stories and bring the neighboring communities into change, massive change, not only at the academic level, but actually at the people who are living on, in the territories, cities, get, how to get cities involved into change. I mean, if we look at inertia and how much we've been talking about transforming societies um, and just the months go by and months go by and, and very little is done. And I think a lot of the academics don't know how to actually work with the people outside of their offices. And a lot of the focus is still on the academic component. And we're seeing, especially the, the, the younger generations, they're not even interested anymore in degrees or they, they don't see any, any future in why invest in, in study if, if the conditions will be totally different. We don't know what the fourth industrial revolution is going to do in terms of jobs um, and the planetary collapse that they're actually already witnessing. Um, many of them are focused on the garbage and the plastic because that's what comes in the media. But um, how do we get people to actually realize what I mentioned earlier about environmental education that we actually depend on nature functioning and it's not us who need to take care of nature we just have to let it alone give it a chance to regenerate assist the regeneration process through that we have to regenerate ourselves and change our habits and so how do you massively change the habits of communities and it seems that it's all going on promoting technological changes where we have to actually go way beyond uh, technology into our social change, our individual change, and do it collectively then. Chris? Uh, um, just a kind of a response to that, uh, and I'm totally with everything you've said. Um, and I also know that the, that the Global Eco Village Network, as an example, is a is a network that is aimed at global transformation you know as is the transitions town network as is extinction rebellion you know xr looks like a protest movement it's actually a pro it's actually a prefigurative mass you know social transformation movement and i just wonder 
is there anything we can do to kind of, you know, to link some of these things together? You that know? is exactly it. We need to link everything together. We need to do a global yeah. network of networks and actually start doing action. I'm actually very much ashamed of my professional uh, work for the last 40 years when I see what Greta has done in six months, more than I have done in 40 years of academic work. Um, and Extinction Rebellion is, is basically on the same. I think we have to learn how to communicate differently. And actually, one of the things I'm, I'm still missing with Greta's communication is um, I think we have to go beyond demanding politicians. Solutions won't come from the United Nations. All the bureaucrats sitting there doing SDGs, which are all technocratic solutions based on the same principles that got us into this mess. Um, it's just, it's just, we have to go beyond there. And these, uh, nobody will make the decisions for us. Nobody will make the change. We have to change every one of us. So the message has to be actually added to what Greg is saying. Uh, it's not governments. Governments will take years to make the change and we need really quick change. So we need to develop transformation processes that are massive, that are kindling, that it's a fire, like those 12 million hectares that burn in Russia this year. Uh, we need to do that at the personal level. Any other any other reflections, Luis? Yes, I I agree both with Edward and Chris, but my my reflection was also in in how to realize or try to figure out the relationship with, between speed, capital, time investment and creating spaces for significant communication or deep communication. Because I see we're still trapped in the polarity. We live life that's based on certain rules and in order to transform, we have to let that life go. But it's hard to listen and shift and this is why the focus on a lot of the kids, like Edward was saying, was in plastics and things that we can actually do in our day-to-day -day without shifting, uh, just by you know nudging. Uh, but what the relationship is between speed, capital, and time investment is critical because in regenerative work, and I, I'm sure Edward has seen it in Colombia. You know, if we can inject some capital and get people together and get them in spaces for deep conversations, that's going to speed transitions, but the capital, where is it coming from? The time, where is it coming from? Uh, and, and how can that affect speed in the most efficient manner? So this is the reflection that stays in my mind because it's not fully clear for me. Um, I'm just reflecting on Edward's uh, question, what brings cities into change? Um, and I was thinking of, of my own uh, work with people and organisations. And um, when I'm working as a coach or a facilitator with people who don't know that they know what it is that they want to talk about, we often fall back on a much more ontological set of questions. So some people know that they need to change. And so our entire session, our entire work is goal oriented. But then the quality of the work we do changes and suddenly we're into change management and there is a quality of the work that is missing. With people who don't know that they know what it is they want to talk about, we have an opportunity to explore it differently. And so those questions are much more about their own sense of, of transition. So how is it now and how are you with how it is now? How do you feel about that? What is it you're thinking about that? What is it you are doing or not doing about that? By the time you've waited until the presenting issues have become intolerable enough for you to realize that you need to change, then it has become something different. I'm wondering if there is a state before awareness of change that 
is what we need to work with in terms of people's understanding of how it is now and how they are with how it is now. So I see Tony's already had to, to drop off. Um, thank you, Alistair, for, for those insights um, and suggestion. I would like to propose, since seeing as we are nearing the end of our a lot of time, it feels way too short, um, that uh, as we close, as a kind of a checkout round, um, we each just share what we would like to do next with this group. So um, as part of a learning collective, which, you, which, which we informally have here, um, that's focused on, on, on systemic transformation, um, what would you like to do next? I mean, we've heard a lot of uh, uh, possibilities here of, of things that we could be doing as well. Um, let's maybe see if we can um, each just share briefly what we'd like to do next. It'll also help those organizing to uh, shape the way forward. Well, I'll go ahead. Um, actually, I think uh, what we do have to do is bring all these networks we're in um, to work together. Uh, I think the, the example of Extinction Rebellion, it still hasn't penetrated in Latin America. It's more a Northern type thing. Um, the same as the Greta movement. Um, it, it is very slow in penetrating Latin America. Basically the, the ground is different. So that is where we can actually collaborate uh, together and develop solutions based on the different territories. I mean, there are no recipes uh, here and we need to co-create solutions based on the different uh, cultural issues. I mean, Costa Rica and Nicaragua might be in Central America, but we're two to totally two different uh, cultures, two different societies. Um, so in the transformation work we're doing here in this network, I would like to see us move forward into action and see how we can actually start really working together um, and, and doing a, a design of, of a project management plan, um, just a basic plan on how to move forward, what are our next actions, how we can actually start moving, how can we can actually start doing things at the country level. So that resonates a lot with me. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking uh, we have been in the midst of developing uh, a sort of plan like that that I've shared with Edward, but I have not shared with others. And uh, this is part of our 15 million euro proposal and there's some work specifically around transforming capacity. Um, and I would be happy to share that with others for a discussion about what a plan might look like if that would be of interest uh, to the next call. Um, May I um, share? Um, or oh, Sean, you're ready? Go ahead, please do. Okay, thanks, John. Um, great, thank you. Um, yeah, this was really great. I really love seeing the different case studies and seeing a lot of connections across them that we haven't had time to fully kind of pull out and connect. So. You know, for me, next steps would be optimal if it somehow included more digestion and integration of what we've seen. I mean, there are very interesting links around land and community and global, um, also around multiple types of capital or different types of metrics, you know, well-being. And so, so there's a lot of richness. And I also enjoy just getting to know other people's projects because I think the more we're aware of each other's strengths and projects and, you know, capacities, we can integrate and weave across each other's skill sets and experience. Um, so, you know, some, you know, continuation of this process of kind of hearing from a few people and having some time to make linkages and, and just start to build some, some meta metacognition um, and, and keep anchoring it into action, you know, you know, micro steps um, and just different, you know, kind of small things we can do to kind of keep it pragmatic and keep it grounded. Um, but, you know, kind of bringing it together in that way. Um, but it was really delicious to see see what people are doing and start to get a sense of of what our total um, experience and skill set is. And I see Louise is echoing that by saying creating the meta network. Um, 
Anyone yeah, else? I, I can add something. It's Johan here. So I've not got my video on, but I've been listening with a lot of interest. Thank you very much for the uh, insights and the presentations. Um, kind of echoing Steve uh, Waddell, which is that um, to me, this has been really inspiring in the sense that what, what I think Steve and I and others are trying to do really resonates with this. And um, imagine uh, uh, more than a network, an actual system that is ready to uh, uh, transfer capital flows to support these kinds of projects. Um, uh, that's what we're thinking. And we're thinking big. Uh, and we're thinking about how we can unlock significant amounts of capital and provide the the kind of platform that will ena enable these flows to happen. Uh, and um, this everything I've heard today resonates with that. So that's really encouraging for me that I think we're to to an extent we're picking up on what might be needed. Thank you. Thanks again. Um, anyone else? Cheryl? Right, thank you. Um, I just would say briefly, since we're out of time, that I am extremely inspired by the call and would like to see these next steps that we've been describing. And I'll chime in wherever I can. Right. Um, I'll probably just use this opportunity just to share that um, one of the things, um, and I'll send it out as well, is that we do have our all gathering momentum event taking place in November. Um, we're working with this question of what's important now in this time of uncertainty between, between extinction and hope. Um, and so for those of you who, um, who are possibly thinking of participating in the Global Business School Network event um, in November, um, we've linked our AGM to that. Um, and what we'd like to do is on the Sunday, the 10th of November, set aside some time specifically to focus on this learning collective asking now what and how do we do that? Um, so this is an invite to, to all of those on the, on the call um, and we'll I'll, I'll circulate it as well. Or I'll ask Steve um, to help me circulate this. Um, but there is space if you, if you wish to meet. We'll also look obviously at uh, virtual participation options um, uh, for, for this particular event. I'll just add that um, a couple last year in Marseille, we had a meeting that was associated with the GRLI. Uh, John does a great job of creating this as an event where others can convene around it. So it's not just about the GRLI, but there are some people involved in GRLI who are interested in advancing this. And I would say that John's certainly in touch with the radicals. I do not. Uh, I'm not of the root of trying to transform business schools, but there are some in there who are working on that. Um, and so if we uh, can talk more about um, the possibility of doing that, I would be very interested. Um, I suggest that the next meeting, um, I can think of another case and uh, that we can bring in, just thinking of the call for uh, tr continuing this uh, sort of uh, our metacognition as Sean uh, referred to it, continue building that and um, having uh, also sharing what we're trying to do to design some actions to be able to address this big challenge and uh, welcome other people's uh, comments and participation too as the basis for a next call and um, this meeting opportunity in um, that John's offering us, what might we want to do there if, uh, if, if we feel like there is something here we want to do together. May I just check, is there anyone else who'd like to, to check out before we, before we close the calls? Because I'm conscious, yes, Chris, not everyone's had a chance to share. Thanks. Yeah, um, so as I said in the check-in, I've been commissioned to write a, uh, a piece on how we as organizations and individuals might want to respond to the prospect of kind of uh, climate and societal collapse. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll drop a note around the email um, just to kind of say what that piece is about. And we're looking for partners who are interested in kind of putting their name to that. So uh, I'll kind of invite you all to consider whether you want to be part of that. So that's one thing. I mean, the other thing I'm struggling with a little bit because I'm, I'm totally with this kind of meta uh, network. Um, but I don't think I know 
kind of what the next step is, you know, other than just kind of making connections and keeping connections going. It feels like the movement is kind of evolving from the ground upwards and it will kind of take its own course. And it's how do you nurture, it's a kind of like a fragile plant at the moment. So how do you nurture it without doing anything inadvertently to, um, to uh, break a part of it that is crucial to its life. So I just, I'm just sitting with that. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The not knowing. Yeah, if I if I may, I've just written on on the chat there for those of you who haven't seen my my feeling as well is that perhaps instead of uh, not that I wouldn't like to learn more about case, cases cases, um, but perhaps we do need to take a bit of time just to reflect on 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 what we've seen and heard today, um, because I have the same um, I guess kind of almost concern that Chris is, is starting to voice there around. Let's not try and put what's happening in terms of collective learning into a box. Um, and, and, and perhaps, you know, um, sense what is needed to support this in, in other places as well, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are other networks. I'm thinking of the work that Jen Bendal is doing, Chris, because you and I were talking about that last week. Um, um, so, you know, may, maybe a bit of sense making would be useful. Just a short thing. Uh, maybe we need to bring in some real good people on storytelling. I agree. I think uh, figuring out narratives associated with this are going, is going to be critical in, in the way we frame and break the barriers and the skins of all the networks that are right now fragmented and be able to start blending in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, maybe, my, mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, oh. Steve, I was going to say the questions that were posed for this were really good. I, I thought they were excellent questions um, that were that used to frame this. It'd be really nice to do the shared learning and some exploration around those. I thought that was that was helpful. Good. Thank you. Um, maybe well, Steve, if, I, if, if I could. So we if we put this online and share it with a few people, I think we will, we will also see some other capabilities emerging. So maybe we can discuss that via email as we go forward. Um, but I know that there's certain capabilities that we don't have within this group or maybe and, some hidden capabilities. And I know there's people just on our own mailing list who weren't able to make it today too. So, um, certainly. Okay. Good. With, with so much gratitude to everyone who's taken part today and as always to our gracious host, Steve, making this possible. In the, in the... Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.